Obadiah chapter 1. This is the vision that the Sovereign Lord revealed to Obadiah concerning the land of Edom. Edom's judgment announced. We have heard a message from the Lord that an ambassador was sent to the nations to say, get ready, everyone. Let's assemble our armies and attack Edom. The Lord says to Edom, I will cut you down to size among the nations. You will be greatly despised. You have been deceived by your own pride because you live in a rock fortress and make your home high in the mountains. Who can ever reach us way up here, you ask boastfully. But even if you soar as high as eagles and build your nest among the stars, I will bring you crashing down, says the Lord. If thieves came at night and robbed you, what a disaster awaits you. They would not take everything. Those who harvest grapes always leave a few for the poor, but your enemies will wipe you out completely. Every nook and cranny of Edom will be searched and looted. Every treasure will be found and taken. All your allies will turn against you. They will help to chase you from your land. They will promise you peace while plotting to deceive and destroy you. Your trusted friends will set traps for you and you won't even know about it. At that time, not a single wise person will be left in the whole land of Edom, says the Lord. For on the mountains of Edom, I will destroy everyone who has understanding. The mightiest warriors of Teman will be terrified and everyone on the mountains of Edom will be cut down in the slaughter. Reasons for Edom's punishment. Because of the violence you did to your close relatives in Israel, you will be filled with shame and destroyed forever. When they were invaded, you stood aloof, refusing to help them. Foreign invaders carried off their wealth and cast lots to divide up Jerusalem, but you acted like one of Israel's enemies. You should not have gloated when they exiled your relatives to distant lands. You should not have rejoiced when the people of Judah suffered such misfortune. You should not have spoken arrogantly in that terrible time of trouble. You should not have plundered the land of Israel when they were suffering such calamity. You should not have gloated over their destruction when they were suffering such calamity. You should not have seized their wealth when they were suffering such calamity. You should not have stood at the crossroads killing those who tried to escape. You should not have captured the survivors and handed them over in their terrible time of trouble. Now? There we go. All right. Just being silly today. All right. Hey, welcome to week two of our series through the book of Obadiah. Like I said uh, last week, the book of Obadiah is a rarely read book in the Bible. But over the next couple weeks, through our messages and through our study journals that we have created for you, uh, we're going to see several things that we can learn from this short book. So go ahead and grab your Bible, open up to the book of Obadiah. It is a minor prophet, so it's in the sticky pages of your Bible, several books after the book of Psalms. The book of Obadiah can be split into two parts, which is what we're going to be doing with it. Today we're going to cover Obadiah 1 through 14, and then next week, uh, my friend Dennis McConaughey will cover Obadiah 15 through 21. Now I'm going to give you some Bible study tips today. Every time I read a new book of the Bible, I pick up one of these ESV scripture journals. And then I read through the entire book with this journal, and I begin to take notes in the journal. Questions I have, things I don't understand, confusion, questions, anything like that, I write them down in this journal because I want to approach the text with fresh eyes and I want to let the text speak, to, speak for itself first before I dive into a study Bible or commentaries or a sermon. Then I will generally listen to the entire text 
in a different translation. I love the New Living Translation, so I use the Streetlights Bible app, which is what you just heard, to listen to the text in its entirety. And then I'll read aloud in another translation, usually the message, and then I will begin to look at commentaries and study the text. Okay? This is my method. It's not the only method, but it might be worth a try next time. I'd also encourage you to buy a study Bible. Okay? If you're going to be studying Scripture, it's important to have a study Bible. We're going to jump into Obadiah, starting in verse 1, where it says this. The vision of Obadiah, thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a report from the Lord, and a messenger has been sent among the nations. Rise up, let us rise against her for battle. This is Obadiah's vision from the Lord concerning Edom. Now remember that Edom is the nation that descended from Esau, and Obadiah is from the nation of Israel, which descended from Jacob. Okay? And then we have what we call a pandemic phrase or expression. It says, we have heard a report from the Lord, which is actually more accurately translated. We have heard a hearing of the Lord. And this tells us God is speaking. And what does God say? He says, rise up. Let us rise against her for battle. This is a declaration of war straight from the Lord. And he continues, Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You shall be utterly despised. Now the thing you have to know about Edom is Edom is a great nation. A very powerful nation. Given its location in the mountains, it was very difficult to get to Edom. And God says that they will be utterly despised. Which is to say God is turning away from them. Now remember last week we talked about how when Israel entered the promised land to conquer it, God gave specific instructions, leave Edom alone. In Deuteronomy 2.5 it says this, Do not contend with them, for I will not give you any of their land, no, not so much as for the sole of the foot you tread on, because I have given Mount Seir to Esau as a possession. So God had been looking favorably at Edom, and now he's not. Why is that? Well, Edom made several mistakes, which we'll read about in the first part of verse 3, that it is rooted in their pride. It says this, The pride of your heart has deceived you. Pride is at the root of Edom's problems, which is what we're going to be exploring today. So we're going to talk about pride, and then we're going to look at how Edom let their pride get the best of them. Now, most of us would probably say, I'm not proud, right? Anybody want to admit that they're proud? Okay, a few of you, all right. The Bible says otherwise. We all have pride in our hearts. Over a hundred times in Scripture, we find references to pride. Here are just a few. Proverbs 16.5 says, Everyone who is prideful in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. That tells us that God despises pride. Why? Because pride says that you are better than others and even better than God. That you know better. And at the root of all sin is pride. Because sin is disobedience to God and His Word. And when we sin, we are saying... I don't want this, so I'm going to have it my way, even though I shouldn't. I know better, so I'm going to live life how I want. Sin is rebellion to God. And when we sin, we're telling God we know better than Him. That's pride. It started off in the Garden of Eden with Eve. She looked at the tree that God forbid her to eat from and said, I know better than God. This fruit looks good, so I'm going to take it. And she did. And that pride continues today. Proverbs 8, 13 says this, The fear of the Lord is a hatred of evil, pride and arrogance, and the way of evil and perverted speech 
I hate. So if we fear the Lord, and that doesn't mean that we're afraid of God, it means that we have an understanding of who God is, that he is holy and just and righteous. It is a respect for God, but it is also an understanding of how much God hates sin and fear his judgment that comes with sin, even in the life of a born-again believer. Hebrews 12 tells us that God disciplines those whom he loves, his children, those of us who are born again. We are disciplined as children of God, not out of hate, but out of his desire for us to live a life that is obedient to him. The fear of God is respecting him, obeying him, submitting to his discipline in our life, and worshiping him in awe. Proverbs 8.13 tells us that if we fear God, we should hate what is evil. Pride, arrogance, the way of evil, corrupt speech are evil in the eyes of God, and so we should hate them. Proverbs 11.2 says, when pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with humble is wisdom. There is wisdom in in humility and disgrace in pride our pride leads us into all sorts of sin james 4 warns us about this in verse 6 he says this god opposes the pride or the proud but gives grace to those who are humble james goes on to say in verse 10 humble yourselves before the lord and he will exalt you so when we are proud We are in opposition to God. And if you place yourself in opposition to God because of your attachment to this world, He will oppose you. Your pride mirrors the pride, the king of pride, Satan, who tried to exalt himself above God. And this is what Edom has done here in Obadiah. They took pride in the strength of their defenses, Verse 3 and 4 says this, The pride of your heart has deceived you, you who live in the clefts of the rock, in your lofty dwelling, who say with your heart, Who will bring me down to the ground? Though you soar aloft like an eagle, though your nest is set among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. See, their national pride rested in their defensible position. They thought they were undefeatable that they were unstoppable. And God says that in spite of their strategic position, he will be the one who brings them down. But it wasn't just their defenses. They put far too much trust in their allies. Starting in verse 5, it says this, If the thieves came to you and if plunderers came by night, how have you been destroyed? Would they not steal only enough for themselves? If grape gatherers came to you, would they not leave gleanings? How Esau has been pillaged, his treasures sought out. All your allies have driven you to your border. Those at peace with you have deceived you. And they have prevailed against you. Those who eat your bread have set a trap beneath you. And you have no understanding. Or better said, you can't even detect it. You don't realize what your allies are doing to you. It appears that Edom had forgot that even your allies always look out for their best interests first before your interests. And Edom's allies had set a trap for Edom. They were planning to betray and plunder Edom of all its wealth. And Edom sat at the table and ate and missed it. They didn't detect that their current allies were setting them up while they sat at the table and dined with them. And why did they miss it? Pride. Verse 8 and 9 tells us, Will I not on that day, declares the Lord, destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of Mount Esau, and all your mighty men shall be dismayed, O Temmin, so that every man from Mount Esau will be cut off by slaughter. See, not only was Edom prideful of their defensive positions, not only did they trust their allies far too much, but Edom put their confidence in wise men, the experts, worldly wisdom. 
They put their confidence in their mighty men, their own human strength. Edom put their hope in the world rather than God. Psalm 146 verse 5 says this, Blessed is he whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God. See, Edom made a mistake. Rather than looking to God for strength, rather than turning to God for wisdom, Edom and their pride turned to the world. And as a result, destruction and death awaited them. But verse 10 tells us the biggest mistake of them all. It says this, Because of the violence done to your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. See, Edom stood and watched as God's people were attacked. 2 Thessalonians 1.6 says, God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you. See, God doesn't take lightly when you mess with His children. Mess with God's kid and He will mess you up. But it wasn't just that they stood and did nothing while Israel was attacked, while God's people were suffering, they also jumped in and helped the oppressors. It says on the, on, in verse 11, On that day you stood aloft. On that day the strangers carried off his wealth. Foreigners entered his gate and cast lots for Jerusalem. And you were like one of them. See, Edom stood and watched as God's people were abused and did nothing says in verse 12, But do not gloat over the day of your brother and the day of his misfortune. Do not rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their ruin. Do not boast in the day of distress. See, they stood by and watched them suffer. They took part in the looting and then they joined in in the mocking and insulting of God's people. They rejoiced at Israel's pain. Verse 13, do not enter the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Do not gloat over their disaster in the day of his calamity. Do not loot his wealth in the day of his calamity. Edom not only celebrated Israel's pain, but they joined in. They benefited from the pain of their brother. And in verse 14 it says, do not stand at the crossroads to cut off his fugitives. Do not hand over his survivors in the day of distress. See, when Israel tried to retreat, when they tried to escape their oppressors, when they were running from the enemy, Edom closed its borders and watched Israel die. Why? Why did Edom bring national shame upon themselves? Why did they turn their back on their own family? Why did they watch God's people suffer? pride. See, that's the thing about pride. It's blinding. We think we are something. We think that we can handle life on our own, life our way, on our terms. But let's look at our life compared to Edom. You have a chart that you received. I'm going to give you the answers. I also dropped them in the Church Center app because I understand it's probably going to be a little bit difficult to read. We're going to start in the top left corner and work left to right and down. Okay? So that first box says pride in their defenses. We read about that in Obadiah verse 3 and 4. And like Edom, we take pride in our own prosperity. Romans 12, 3 says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned to you. 1 Timothy 6, 17 says, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, not to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. See, we put pride in our own prosperity. So I have to ask you, is your life going well? Are you doing well financially? Are you doing well physically? Well, don't think too highly of yourself. 
See, riches and fame will fade. Don't put your trust in those things. Seek God and His provision for your life over your prosperity. The next one down, they, they put too much trust in their, ally, in, in their allies. We read that in Obadiah 5-7. through 7. We put too much trust in our friends. 1 Corinthians 15.33 says this, Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. So what kind of friends do you have? Who are you spending time with? Are you following God, or are you following the world? See, the people you hang out with, the people that you spend time with, will influence how you live. And if you put your trust in ungodly people, you will end up living ungodly lives. And so we need to think about the friends that we have. The next one down, they put trust in their wise men. Obadiah 8. We put our trust in worldly wisdom. Proverbs 13.20 says, Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Proverbs 26.12 says, Do you see a man who is wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than him. Are you looking to God for wisdom? Or are you looking to the world? Is your life based on the Word of God? Or the opinions and the ways of the world? See, Satan is the ruler of this world. And his plan for your life is death and destruction. God's, light, God's Word leads to life and light. So which one are you following? God's Word or the world's wisdom? Obadiah 9 tells us they put trust in their mighty men and we put trust in our own strength and abilities. Psalm 46.1 says this, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. So are you living your own life in your own strength or in the strength of God? Are you trying to live your life independently or are you dependent on God? See, you can live this life based on your own abilities and your own strength, or you can rely on God's strength and find success in life. See, when we try to live independent from God, we oftentimes live ungodly lives. When we think we know how to live our life better than God, it's very quickly realize that we don't know anything and so the question is are you living dependent on God dependent on God's people or are you trying to live a life on your own isolated and independent the next one down Obadiah 12 through 13 says they verbally verbally abused God's people we oftentimes find ourselves mocking others Psalm 101 verse 5 says this, Whoever slanders his neighbor secretly, I will destroy. Whoever has a haughty look and an arrogant heart, I will not endure. So ask yourself, how do you treat other people? Do you treat other people that you encounter as image bearers of God? That means, do you treat people in your life as people who are made in the image of God? How about those who look different than you? How about those who act different than you? How about those who disagree with you? How about those who are on the opposite side of the political aisle than you? Are you honoring others? Or are you looking down on them? Because Edom found themselves abusing God's people. And oftentimes we find ourselves looking down on others because they're different than us. Obadiah 14 says they block the way of the retreat. And we often watch those who are suffering without helping. 
Galatians 6, 2 says, Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So when you see someone in need, do you help them? Are you in a community of believers where they know you well enough that they can help you bear your burdens? Are you too proud to be vulnerable with other people? Are you too proud to ask for or accept help? See, Edom, as we see them in Obadiah, is a picture of our own human condition. They're a picture of the pride of this world. In fact, in Hebrew, Edom is spelled with the same letters as Adam. And Adam is the word for mankind. I think in Obadiah, we are supposed to see ourselves in Edom. And we're supposed to recognize our sin and our pride, and learn from Edom, not to make the mistakes they made, but to humble ourselves before the Lord. Remember that verse we read in James, James 4, 6? God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. James shows us a solution to our pride. He shows us that if we will humble ourselves before God, then He will pour out His grace upon us, And if we're honest with ourselves, we all struggle with pride in one way or another. There is pride in our heart. And the solution to that is to humble ourselves before God. Edom would not do that. They would not humble themselves, and as a result, they experience justice from God rather than grace. But if we read that next verse in James 4, verse 7, it says... Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. See, if we will recognize our weakness, if we will stop fighting, if we will actually surrender to God, then the enemy of our souls, the king of pride, will flee from us. Romans 12, 1 and 2 talks about what our submission to God is should look like. It says this, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. See, our submission to God and our rejection of the world, and the way that it leads us to live our life is the key to fighting our pride. When we submit to God, it leads to transformation of our minds and our hearts. But it requires something that will cost us greatly. Something that we will struggle to give up for the rest of our lives. See, in order to fully submit to God, in order to be transformed in our minds and our heart, it requires us to lay down our pride. It requires us to submit to God. It requires humility. And that's something that we often struggle with. And so as we look back on Edom and the mistakes they made in Obadiah 1 through 14, we find at the root of all of it is pride. And so the question today as we move into our time of response is what is at the root of your heart? Is it pride? Are you living a life like Edom? Are you living a life where you are proud of your own prosperity? You are proud of what you've achieved. Look at all that I've done. Look at how great I am. Are you proud, so proud of the wisdom of the world? And rather than reading God's word, I'd rather Google it for the answer. Are you trusting your friends too much? Are the people you're hanging out with leading you to a path of destruction or to a path of life? 
What is your life like? Are you mocking other people? When people disagree with you, when people have a different opinion than you, even if they're wrong, do you treat them poorly? See, the problem is is that we often live a life full of pride. And we're unwilling to be vulnerable and honest with ourselves, much less the people we love. See, God's Word tells us that we are called to live dependent on Him and dependent on each other. So we can live like Edom, a life of independence and arrogance and pride. Or we can live a life that honors God. A life where we are humble, where we are vulnerable, where we are willing to lay down our preferences, our opinions, our way, and let God have His way in our life. So I ask you as we continue in worship, is there pride in your heart? Do you need to lay it down today? Maybe for you it's the first opportunity that you've heard that there's a different way than the way of this world. So I'll tell you today, there is a God in heaven who created you, who has an incredible plan for your life. He has a plan for your life that is far different than the, the life that you are living today. So you have an opportunity today. If you've not yet made Jesus Christ Lord and Savior of your life, if you've not yet submitted to Him, then you have an opportunity to lay down your pride at the feet of Jesus and experience grace and forgiveness from a God who loves you. But if you're already a believer and you're struggling in any of these areas that Edom was struggling in with pride, I want to encourage you today as we worship to just humbly lay those things at the feet of Jesus. To lay those down and walk away and experience the love and grace of a Father who has an incredible plan for your life. God, I'm grateful for your word. I'm grateful for the example of Edom. How not to live a life that is selfish and prideful. God, help us to live a life that honors you. Holy Spirit, we pray that you search our minds and our hearts. Bring up any areas in our life where we are struggling to give up control. Struggling to let you in. Struggling to lay down our pride, our preferences, our way. God, we submit to you today. We lay it at your feet. And we say, have your way in us. In Jesus' name, amen.